Report here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, as we spend the rest of the hour discussing what our next guest calls the apocalyptic twins, nuclear and climate threats. This week, NBC News reported President Trump called for a nearly tenfold increase in the U.S. nuclear weapons arsenal during a meeting with high-ranking military leaders. It was after this that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson reportedly called Trump a moron. On Wednesday, Trump lashed out at NBC on Twitter, suggested NBC's broadcast license should be revoked as punishment for its reporting. Today, Trump is slated to announce the U.S. will decertify the landmark 2015 Iran nuclear deal although it appears Trump's now backed away from his plans to withdraw from the U.S. from the deal entirely. Instead, the White House expected to instruct Congress to leave the agreement intact for now, after he came under enormous domestic and international pressure not to unravel the landmark deal. In the last week, Trump has also repeated threats of war against North Korea, tweeting, quote, "...presidents and their administrations have been talking to North Korea for 25 years, agreements made and massive amounts of of money paid hasn't worked, agreements violated before the ink was dry, making fools of U.S. negotiators. Sorry, but only one thing will work," he tweeted. In brief comments to reporters Saturday, Trump was asked to clarify that remark, as well as a cryptic comment he made last week during a meeting with top generals, in which he warned about the calm before the storm. Nothing, nothing to clarify. Well, you'll figure that out pretty soon. You'll figure that out pretty soon, he said, when asked about the calm before the storm, what it was. Meanwhile, the U.S. is struggling to recover from a series of hurricanes and now wildfires that climate scientists have linked to climate change. The 10th hurricane this year, Ophelia, has just been named. There have not been 10 hurricanes in one season since 1893. Well, our next guest wonders if the storms have contributed to what he calls a shift in our awareness of climate truths. On Thursday, Democracy's Now!, Shanermeen Sheikh and I sat down with Robert J. Lifton, leading American psychiatrist, author of more than 20 books about the effects of nuclear war, terrorism, genocide. His new book is titled The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mind, Hope and Survival. His past books, Death and Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, for which he won the National Book Award, The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide, and Witness to an Extreme Century, a memoir. Dr. Lifton's also a distinguished professor emeritus of psychology and psychiatry at the City University of New York. I began by asking him to talk about what is now happening uh, between the U.S. and North Korea and Iran, and President Trump's closest aides expressing concern that Trump is unraveling. I also belong to a group called The Duty to Warn, which uh, is a group of psychiatrists and psychologists who feel we have the right and the obligation to speak out about Trump's psyche when it endangers the country and the world. Uh, and what we're seeing, uh, you mentioned the potential unraveling of the pact with Iran. There's also the potential unraveling of Donald Trump, uh, which seems to be occurring. Uh, it's hard to read him, because his behavior, as I understand it, is completely solipsistic. He sees the world through his own sense of self, what he needs and what he feels, and he couldn't be more erratic uh, or scattered or dangerous. So the exchange with North Korea has to be terrifying to all of us. Uh, it's not something that can be controlled. You have two leaders who are bent on hyperbole and uh, intense threat to the other uh, and have their own motivations, each of which is hard for us to read. But we can read the danger that they represent, particularly since we've learned recently that Trump is on record for demanding something like 10 times the number of nuclear weapons. And that's what I call extreme nuclearism, a kind of embrace of the weapons to do everything that they can't do. The only thing nuclear weapons can do is destroy countries, cities, destroy human beings. Uh, but since they came into being, there's been an impulse to embrace them and see them as saviors 
prevent war, keep the world going, uh, maintain authority on the part of the nuclear weapons-possessing nations. So Trump is into that extreme nuclearism. And at the same time, as you mentioned, with the other apocalyptic twin, the terrible and very real uh, threat of climate change, global warming. He and his followers are blocking every reasonable effect uh, that was put forward at Paris uh, in 2015, and which the world, through which the world seeks to confront uh, what may be the gravest danger it's ever faced. That's where we are. Well, I mean, to go back to what, what you said initially, um, the, the group that you're a part of, uh, the psychiatric group, you're a contributor to a book called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. What are some of the key concerns uh, about Trump that you and your colleagues raise? Well, uh, I wrote a letter together, together with Judith Herman to The New York Times, in which we raised two issues. One was his relation to reality, which is, uh, I would say, solipsistic and un uh, untenable uh, and very dangerous to everyone. What do you mean, solipsistic? Solipsistic with, from within the self. In other words, he only sees the world from within his sense of self. He can't have empathy for others. He can't really think into the future the consequences of his actions, because he's totally preoccupied with the immediate event and how he can deal with it or manipulate it as emerging through uh, perce the perception on the part of his sense of self. That's very extreme. Uh, people who are psychotic behave that way, and yet, for the most part, Trump is not psychotic. Uh, that combination makes him really dangerous. So that relationship to reality is one thing. And the other thing that Judith Herman and I wrote about was um, his uh, difficulty with crises and his extreme behavior uh, and attack mode in, instead of any kind of uh, any kind of uh, balance which a president needs to deal with a crisis. So those were two. Uh, and in this regard, I write about what we call malignant normality. So he's the president. A president takes actions. There's a tendency to normalize them, because, after all, he is the president, he's in charge, when what is called normality is completely malignant and harmful. And I came to that idea through work on Nazi doctors. They were expected to reverse healing and killing, and really take the lead in killing in Auschwitz. I'm not accusing any Americans of being Nazi doctors. I'm saying that this is a model of malignant normality, and we now face it with Trump and his uh, administration. I wanted to ask you about your group, Duty to Warn. Um, Vanity Fair has a piece where Steve Bannon, the disgraced White House aide, um, said he um, told President Trump that his concern should be the 25th Amendment, um, you know, not being impeached, but the cabinet um, voting him out. Uh, he says something like Trump has a 30 percent chance of making it through his term. You are a psychiatrist. Can you talk further about what it would take, um, if it wasn't an impeachable crime, for to remove President Trump? Um, why you believe uh, he is a danger right now? Uh, it's unclear whether or how Trump will be removed from or resigned from the presidency before the completion of his term. Uh, one doesn't know that. It will probably, in my judgment, be a political rather than a psychological act. I mean, one could take the 25th Amendment and his cabinet and vice president could attest to his unfitness for being president. That but the cabinet are his appointees. Yeah. It doesn't seem very likely, does it? But rather, what's happening now is that there's a dialogue between this psychological, psychiatric group and Congress people, in which 
uh, they, we are bringing information about Trump's unfitness, which becomes part of the political dialogue. It will probably be— Are you be, talking to Congress members? Yes, yes. People from this group are talking to Congress people. Uh, and it will probably be a political decision that removes Trump. And that means an election process and uh, the issue of whether you get a Democratic uh, House or Senate and uh, other political issues that will become very important. But this is now part of the dialogue. Everybody knew that Trump was bizarre, strange, uh, uh, was unreliable, unfit to be president. It's been known by the hypocritical Republicans for a very long time. Uh, but putting it forward by psychologists and psychiatrists gives it a certain greater authority and becomes part of that dialogue and recognition. That's the way that I see it, rather than a clear-cut removal through the 25th Amendment. Though one doesn't know, because there's more and more evidence about Trump's uh, campaign's collusion in Russia uh, and pot potentially about obstruction of justice, and all these could play a part. He could attempt to fire Mueller, as he's threatened to do, and that could bring about a constitutional crisis. So we don't know. We can't predict what process will occur. The psychological now is in dialogue with the political. I wanted to read to you uh, the New York Times editorial on Thursday, one finger on the button is too few. And they write, the broad debate over President Trump's fitness for the difficult and demanding office he holds has recently been reframed in a more pointed and urgent way. Does he understand and he can he responsibly manage the most destructive nuclear arsenal on Earth? The question arises for several reasons. He's threatened to totally destroy North Korea. He's reportedly pressed for a massive buildup in the American nuclear arsenal, which already contains too many, 4,000 warheads. And soon he'll decide whether to sustain or set a course to possibly unravel the immensely important Iran nuclear deal. It goes on to cite Corker, who said he's leading to World War III, and Rex Tillerson, who reportedly called him a moron. Um, and he said, and the time goes on to say, um, Mr. Trump's policy pronouncements during the campaign betrayed either profound ignorance or dangerous nonchalance. At one point, he wondered why America had nuclear weapons if it didn't use them. At another, he suggested Japan and South Korea, which have long lived under American security umbrella, should develop their own nuclear weapons. But nothing he has been quite as unsettling as is his recent tweet storms about North Korea, fire and fury, the calm before the storm. And so they are saying, they're calling for, many have hoped and still Hope Trump's aggressive posture is mostly theater, designed to slake the thirst for attention, keep adversaries off guard. But there's no underlying strategy to his loose talk. And whatever he means by it, Congress has been sufficiently alarmed to consider legislation that would bar the president from launching a first nuclear strike without a declaration of war by Congress. It wouldn't take away the president's ability to defend the country. They say that's a sound idea and could be made stronger with a requirement that the secretaries of defense and state also approve any such decision. As things stand now, the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, passed when there was more concern about trigger-happy generals than elected civilian leaders, gives the president sole control. He could unleash the apocalyptic force of the American nuclear arsenal by his word alone and within minutes. Well, any restriction on the president, any president, but especially Trump, on his capacity to uh, initiate a nuclear war, any restriction on that is profoundly desirable. It's a strange world, to say the least, when the generals are there to restrain the civilian. The generals in, in, uh, are, on the whole, known for their re military restraint. There are exceptions. Um, with, with the Vietnam War, as you know, it was initiated by civilians, the best and the brightest, as it was called. The military was at first a little reluctant, then entered it and became corrupted by it and created what I came to call atrocity-producing situations. That could happen here, too, with the generals who are ostensibly restrainers. Uh, 
allowing him, being unable to prevent him from initiating some form of war, being themselves drawn in and then corrupted by it. That's a really dangerous sequence. Anything that holds that back or in check is desirable. This year, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Do you see that as significant? I do see that as very significant, because uh, there is a mindset that rejects nuclearism. Nuclearism is the embrace of weapons to, as I said before, to do all the things they can't do and to utilize them uh, instead of what should be utilized in the way of peacemaking. So giving the Nobel Peace Prize to a group that seeks to outlaw all nuclear weapons uh, recognizes that mindset the critical mindset toward nuclear weapons. And, you know, I was part of the anti-nuclear movement, still am, but particularly the doctor's role in anti-nuclear work. And uh, I think we have reason to believe that the whole anti-nuclear movement from all directions was a significant factor in preventing the use of nuclear weapons since Nagasaki in 1945. It doesn't mean that we're on fine ground with nuclear weapons. It's still extremely dangerous, as we're discussing. But the uh, prevention of their use was certainly influenced by anti-nuclear movements and a rejection of nuclearism. Your work with bringing out the voices of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki victims, I wanted to turn to one of those victims. In fact, when we interviewed ICANN after they won the Nobel Peace Prize, they talked about the voices of the Habakusha being so critical. Um, in 2016, we spoke to Setsuko Thurlow, a survivor of the U.S. bombing of Hiroshima, August 6, 1945, now an anti nuclear activist who works as a social worker in Toronto, Canada, uh, serving Japanese-speaking immigrants. She described that day, August 6, 1945. I was a 13-year-old grade 8 student at the girls' school, and I was mobilized by the Army, like, you know, together with a group of about 30 schoolmates, and we were trained to act as a decoding assistants. And that very day, being Monday, we were to start the day's work as a full-fledged decoding assistant. At 8 o'clock, we had the morning assembly, and the Major Yanai gave us a pep talk. And we said, we will do our best for Emperor's sake. And at that moment, I saw the bluish-white flash in the windows. I was on the second floor of the wooden building, which was one mile uh, or 1.8 kilometer away from the um, ground zero. And after seeing the flash, I had a sensation of floating in the air. Uh, all the buildings were flattened by the blast and falling, and obviously the building I was in was falling, and my body was falling together with it. That's the end of my recollection. That was Satsuko Thurlow. She was a survivor of the U.S. bombing of Hiroshima. And in your book, The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mine, Hope and Survival, you talk about the apocalyptic twins, nuclear and climate threats. Talk about this voice. Well, most of the Habakusha have died out at this point. Survivors uh, have a special form of witness. And many of them, including particularly Hiroshima survivors, as you know, uh, so-called hibaksha, have traveled around the world and told their stories. And that does us a service, and it does them a service as well, because it gives meaning to an otherwise intolerable kind of uh, experience. Uh, they sense that they know something that the rest of us don't know. And what they know, what they've learned, is the capacity of our technology, our weaponry, 
to destroy our entire species and much of the planet. Uh, they know that in a visceral way, in a way that we don't know. Dr. Robert J. Lifton is a leading American psychiatrist, author of more than 20 books, his latest, The Climate Swerve, Reflections on Mind, Hope and Survival. When we come back, I ask him about climate change, which he's called the apocalyptic twin of nuclear war. Stay with us.